I am Marko Mekele, lead developer in ADB at MariaDB Corporation. And now I would like to talk about some changes that uh, we made to the locking and latching primitives in InnoDB for the MariaDB 10.6 release. Heikki Turi, the creator of InnoDB, wanted to distinguish locks and latches. So he calls uh, locks something that are held by transactions maybe for up to hours until the transaction is committed. A locking read would acquire a record lock or a table lock and hold that until the commit or rollback. And latches would be something internal to the implementation, such as page latches. They would be held for maybe microseconds, nanoseconds, or even milliseconds if you are running on slow storage and uh, a page needs to be read into the buffer pool and we have to wait for the for the read operation to complete or we want to lock the page while it is being written to the file we can allow concurrent reads but not concurrent writes to the page there are also non-locking reads inside a transaction in a DB supports multi-version concurrency control and those non-locking reads wouldn't acquire any transactional locks but they would acquire page latches or if some page is not in the buffer pool they might even acquire the buffer pool mutex for the purpose of uh, ultimately reading the page into the buffer pool and accessing it. The first section of my talk is about improvements to the latches and to the use of latches that are acquire, actually required for correctness. In operating systems or even in the C++ standard library you will find mutexes, condition variables and read write locks where they are called shared mutex in C++. A mutex is basically an exclusive lock typically acquired around a critical section while modifying some global state that needs to be consistent between multiple threads that might be accessing it. A read-write lock is similar but it allows a mode where multiple readers can access their resource while no, no thread is modifying it. Exclusive shared mutex or exclusive read-write lock would still prevent any other threat from accessing the resource. And uh, combined with mutexes there are condition variables. This can be used uh, to implement some kind of notification mechanism when some global state is protected by a mutex and threats want to be informed or woken up when some interesting change is made to the global state. For example, an in a DB thread uh, wants to signal uh, to wake up the buffer pool uh, cleaner thread tell it that there is some new work to do or we need to wait for the buffer pool cleaning batch to finish before something in the buffer pool becomes available. Before MariaDB 10.6 uh, there were some homebrew or custom implementation of synchronization primitives in InnoDB, mostly mutex and event. Mutex was a, a rather complex wrapper around a normal operating system mutex. There was a spin loop for attempting to acquire the mutex in case it is reserved. The spin loop would try to acquire the mutex for some time before going to sleep. And then there was this sync array which registered all waiting threads inside InnoDB so that the, you would see in the error log some long semaphore wait output. Or ultimately if, if the long wait was longer than the InnoDB fatal uh, threshold then the server would kill itself. There was also something called event which I guess was emulating something that was available in older versions of 
Microsoft Windows. But since Microsoft Windows Vista condition variables are actually supported, so there is no real, no real use of, of using these events. They were wrapping a mutex, a condition variable, and a boolean flag. So in MariaDB 10.6 we are using normal mutexes and uh, condition variables instead of using these homebrew mutexes and uh, events. Also, there were custom read-write locks. Uh, these uh, were used for all purposes, even though for many purposes it was an overkill. We could use plain read-write locks with no recursion or ownership passing for many things. But uh, we were actually using the same implementation for everything in, in ADB. Complex implementation was only needed for page latches and index latches, basically. So the page latches have some special requirements, especially because of uh, blob operations. When a record is being inserted and doesn't fit into the page, then InnoDB may create overflow pages for the long columns, so called blob pages, binary large object. And when we are writing those blobs, we actually allow the blob to be larger than the buffer pool. So we are not locking all the blob pages in the buffer pool at the same time. We are writing the blob one page at a time. Because it's done like that, uh, we must use several mini transactions for writing the blob pages. One, one sub mini transaction per written page. And that sub mini transaction may allocate more pages or will allocate more pages and it uh, may modify the blob pointer in the index leaf page that is pointing to the start of the blob. So for this, uh, we must uh, share some page latches with the parent mini transaction that has already possibly already acquired uh, allocated some pages for, for the insert operation and is definitely holding uh, has already made modifications to the index page for inserting the record so for this uh, ownership uh, sharing between two mini transactions we need recursion if, if the thread has already acquired the page latch it may acquire the page latch again without waiting because it's the current holder. So we have a reference count for, for the page latches in this case. We also need to support ownership passing. When a page write is initiated, the thread that is initiating it must acquire a latch on the page to prevent concurrent modification of the page. But that latch would be released by another thread which is uh, going to be invoked when the page write completes. And we don't even know which thread that will be when we are initiating the write. So we, are, we must uh, acquire the latch in a kind of disowned mode so that uh, this uh, recursion logic must not kick in if the same thread happens to attempt to acquire that page latch again. It must wait until the latch has been released by the I.O. thread. Also, one more special requirement is uh, this update mode. It's a special version of the exclusive mode, which does not allow exclusive or other update logs to be existing concurrently, but uh, it does allow concurrent readers. For example, if the persistent auto increment uh, field in the index root page is being modified, protected by this update log, at the same time we can allow reads of other fields in the page. The persistent auto increment uh, field is not normally read by anything, only when opening the table. I said that uh, we are using normal mutexes instead of these homebrew ones, but that was actually a small lie. We are reinventing the mutex where needed. In a few cases it is better to have a smaller mutex than the default operating system mutex. For historical reasons, for example, with the GNU C library on a 64-bit system, the 
size of a mutex would be 48 bytes and with the performance schema instrumentation it would be uh, 8 bytes more for, for that pointer and we don't actually need that for some mutexes which are instantiated with small data objects for which there is no much, not much contention. For example, there is a mutex in the InnoDB table object to protect auto increment counter. And that one, if we make it uh, smaller, then we could have the auto increment counter in the same cache line with the mutex. So when we are acquiring the mutex, we are already reading the value to the processor cache and can access it quickly. So it turns out that uh, we can implement a 4-byte mutex on Windows. Even we, we have uh, this uh, Linux Futex equivalent called wait on address. But on Windows we also have this slim read write lock. For this purpose we can use that one. There's no need to reinvent something that exists in the operating system. So this slim read write lock would be 4 or 8 bytes depending on the processor word size on Windows. These uh, small mutexes are only used in special cases where we really need to embed mutex in a frequently instantiated data structure. And uh, we obviously will lose the ability to add performance schema instrumentation or a safe mutex with that. The read write locks we also have to reinvent. The uh, original all purpose uh, read write lock logic was simplified for those cases where we actually can use a normal read write lock, no recursion, no ownership passing. And for that, uh, on Windows, we can use this slim read write lock just fine. On uh, Linux and on other systems where we have implemented Futex interface, we can use a Futex based uh, writer prioritizing read write lock. So it would comprise this. Uh, Futex based mutex, which was on the previous slide, with an extra lock word for supporting the readers. And because it's composed of uh, two, two fields, uh, four byte fields, backed by Futex wait queue in the operating system kernel, we have two wait queues. We have one wait queue for the readers who are waiting for a writer to release a lock or a writer to acquire a lock that is waiting for and then release it. And we have a separate waiting queue for the writer who is waiting for the last reader to release the lock so that uh, the writer can acquire it. On systems where we don't have a Futex interface, we can use the native read write lock, which I would guess is typically larger than this 8 bytes. Or we can, if there is no rate write lock type, we can implement one with a, a mutex and two condition variables and a state variable. The index and page touches we can implement based on the futex based uh, read write lock on the previous slide. Even on Windows, we have to do this because we need some extra features. So, uh, it turns out that uh, with this uh, futex based read write lock we can trivially implement a new variant of the exclusive mode, this update mode, which doesn't allow concurrent update mode or concurrent exclusive mode, but it does allow concurrent readers. And this mode, with this mode we can also easily support upgrade and downgrade between the update and exclusive modes. To support the recursion, recursive update and exclusive locks, we have to add two data fields. One is the thread identifier of the current update or exclusive lock holder, so that we know that if we are holding the latch, we don't have to wait, we just increment. And for incrementing, yes, we have this extra field uh, reference count, which uh, has which is divided into two parts uh, for counting the update and uh, exclusive locks held by the current thread. There is also an implementation available that uses a mutex and two condition variables and some atomic operations. It's not really 
optimized well, but uh, it is there for those systems which do not support Futex. Currently we support Futex for Windows and uh, Linux and uh, OpenBSD. It's also available on on FreeBSD and uh, Dragonfly BSD and Mac OS X and uh, maybe some others, but we haven't implemented it yet. There are some benefits of this refactoring. I already mentioned the reduction of memory footprint. Uh, and actually I, uh, that leads to better locality of reference, that you can, can have the mutex or read lock on the same cache line with the data that, it's, that it is protecting. So when you acquire the latch, you will also acquire the uh, you will also load the data to the cache or, or when, you, when you are publishing the data and releasing the lock uh, you are doing it in one single step with no extra cache line traffic. Apart from the auto increment uh, example that I already mentioned uh, this is also very useful for the rollback segments which are protecting transaction metadata so we can have transaction starts and commits more with less contention between between threads or new nodes. We lost uh, this uh, sync array and we also simplified uh, the record lock weights. We no longer have a dynamic allocation of a condition variable for waiting for for a lock to be granted. The refactored lock weight function is simply waiting for a condition variable. And uh, memory for the best example of that is uh, that the buffer page descriptor, uh, si the size of it was uh, 384 bytes in MariaDB 10.2 on 64-bit systems and now we are about half that. And with this refactoring, we also gained uh, some more flexibility because it's based on C++ templates. We can easily determine what, what kind of features we use for index latches, index tree latches. It doesn't make sense to use a spin loop because typically those latches would be held for a longer time in exclusive mode. But for Page latches, the spin loop does make sense because typically page latch conflicts occur on leaf pages and those conflicts or critical sections could be short duration most of the time. Also, we don't have any storage overhead for performance schema, for example, for, for the uh, page latches. It was never instrumented, there was no interface for it, but the memory was being allocated. Uh, in vain, because it was using the common data type for that. Uh, even though this sync array was removed, uh, I implemented a special watch, watchdog for the dictionary system latch, so that we will detect uh, some common cases of server hang, typically server hangs would involve the dictionary system mutex and uh, that is still instrumented even though we don't have this long semaphore weight instrumentation for anything else. The next section is about uh, improving the transactional locks, how we increase the scalability there. So we had a big scalability bottleneck uh, on the lock system mutex it protected uh, the inner DB explicit locks. Uh, inner DB transactional locks are used for anything that is locking records or, or going to modify data. For non-locking rigs, they are not being used. For non-locking rigs, only a shared metadata lock is being acquired to make sure that the concurrent DDL operations such as uh, drop table will not corrupt the data. So for uh, InnoDB locking, we have table locks, usually intention locks, signaling the intention to acquire a shared or exclusive record lock. Foreign key checks would acquire shared locks, but uh, basically any 
data modification would acquire an exclusive lock on a record. For inserts, we don't create explicit uh, record locks. Insert uh, can be detected simply by looking up the transaction ID on the record. If it refers to an active transaction, then that record is implicitly locked in exclusive mode by that transaction. But if there is a record a lock conflict, then explicit lock records will be created. And for update and believe, we currently always create explicit record lock objects. These explicit record lock objects uh, are stored in a hash table, locksys rec hash record hash, uh, indexed by a hash value ca compute from the table sp space identifier and the page number. Record locks are stored in a bitmap uh, which uh, include uh, which are indexed by, by a record heap number which identifies the record in the page. If the page is reorganized then the heap number will be renumbered and if pages are split or merged then page numbers will be changed as well and the record blocks will be moved around in, in the hash table. So we wanted to improve scalability by by uh, doing something about the lock system mutex and that something was that we replaced the mutex with a combination of uh, a read write lock and some lower level latches. So it's still possible to acquire the lock system latch in exclusive mode to lock everything. If we acquire the lock system latch and the transaction mutex that we are interested in, then the transaction cannot be committed and we can check the state of the transaction and determine if something is locked. That's a trivial way. But for best uh, uh, concurrency, we would acquire the lock system latch in shared mode so that multiple threads can get into the same code. And then we would uh, acquire whatever we are interested in if we are interested in whether a table is locked, we would acquire the table lock mutex and then acquire the transaction mutex of, of the transaction that seems to hold the lock on the table. And if that transaction is still active, then we know that, okay, it's really locked by this, this uh, transaction. And similar for the record locks, we would uh, acquire a latch on a cache line in the record uh, hash table and uh, then access the bitmaps that are pointed by the hash table. And once we find an interesting lock, then we could uh, acquire the transaction mutex to check if the transaction is still in active state. So the basic idea is that we allow concurrent access uh, to locks on unrelated uh, tables or, or uh, records or pages. And also to improve the scalability, uh, the lock weight logic was rewritten and uh, the latching order of uh, the locks weight mutex was uh, changed so that the whole time of, of that mutex would be shorter. There used to be a separate thread, a lock timeout thread that would wake up once per second and then that thread would uh, go through some InnoDB bookkeeping of uh, lock weights and then with one second granularity it would notice that okay this lock timeout has expired basically you would for, for a one second transaction timeout you, you would mostly get a two second timeout because you would have this extra thread doing the wake up now with the refactor logic we are directly using a p thread cont timed weight inside this lock weight function and the operating system knows which sets are waiting. We don't have to care about that. Uh, an, analo an analogy about this uh, lock system latch, this concurrent access, would be an apartment building. Previously, this lock system mutex was a global lock on the front door of the building. Only one person can enter the building at a time, and once they lock the front door 
they get in and they, then they are allowed to access any apartment, any room in any apartment. And then they get out and uh, release the lock and then the next guy can get into the building. Now we have this shared uh, lock on the front door. As long as somebody is inside the building, it's not allowed that they are holding a shared lock and it's not allowed uh, for anybody to get an exclusive access such as uh, for demolishing the house. When we are, uh, when we are resizing the NNB buffer pool, we are rebuilding the record lock hash table and that is similar to demolishing a house. So once we uh, have people inside the building, they have shared locks, uh, shared latch on the lock system, then they will acquire locks on the uh, then they will acquire locks on the apartment doors that they, they want to enter. And if they want to acquire enter two apartments, for example, for moving something between two cash lines of the hash table, then they will acquire this in a particular order to avoid deadlocks. And uh, uh, what else? Uh, an alternative might be that uh, instead of having these locks on the apartment doors, you would have a row of mailboxes somewhere else. You would first uh, put the notice on the front door of the building saying that I'm inside or I'm going to be inside. And then you, you go somewhere else, you compute a hash value of what you are going to lock. Uh, uh, what you are going to access inside the building, you go to s some row of mailboxes saying that I'm going to access one of these apartments or rooms, and then you go in. That, that is the approach that was uh, chosen in uh, MySQL 8.0, but uh, in MariaDB we are using the locks near the data, so we avoid uh, such bad uh, locality of reference. When we acquire the lock, we are already load the data into the cache. So here is an example of that. Uh, an update on a page ID2, it will have to create a record lock on that index record. And for that, uh, we will acquire a shared latch on the lock system, and then we will acquire an exclusive latch on, on the hash table chart where this hash value of the page ID is located. And then we will follow the chain of pointers to get to our bitmap page or we will add a new new page if there is no bitmap. And we register the lock. And then we first release uh, this uh, hash uh, chart latch and then we release the global latch so that other threads can enter. Another example is that an insert involves uh, splitting a page. The data doesn't fit in the current page ID 2, so some of the records will be moved uh, to page ID 3. And in this example it happens so that uh, the hash values of these page IDs are in the same shard of the hash table and we only have to acquire one batch on the uh, one batch on one, one shard of, of the record hash table. And then we are free to move data between these record lock bitmaps or create new objects or free old ones. Lock system latch acquisition. When rebuilding the hash table while resizing the inner DB buffer pool. For this operation we will just have to acquire this exclusive latch and then we are free to move records and create a new hash table of a different size and uh, copy everything from the old hash table to the new one and then discard the old hash table and change the pointer. We actually got the race condition uh, which I already mentioned that if you optimistically in some other thread uh, released a shared lock system latch first and then released one of these uh, read while locks on, on on the record hash bitmap, then in that case we we would actually get a case where this uh, buffer pool resizing has freed uh, the hash table and uh, and the thread would uh, be releasing the latch on something that was already freed.
So we catch that with the RR tool and with address sanitizer. One final example is transaction commit. It used to acquire the lock system latch, uh, the lock system mutex exclusively. So you couldn't have multiple transactions committing at the same time. But now, thanks to this shared latch, we can do the following. First, uh, the commit will acquire the transaction mutex and change the state of the transaction. That is what atomically marks the transaction committed. And then it will release that transaction mutex. And other threads can already observe the transaction as committed. But now we have some garbage. We have, we have some explicit locks uh, attached to the transaction. When other threads are visiting this, they might see this uh, block here and uh, notice that it's uh, actually belonging to a committed transaction. They would have to acquire the transaction mutex and check the state and notice that, okay, it's committed, we will ignore this lock. So we would definitely have to re remove those locks to free up memory and to avoid extra processing in other threads. So the transaction commit uh, does it in an optimistic way. It will acquire a shared latch on the lock system and then it will acquire an exclusive mutex on the transaction again and uh, then because this is the wrong order of normally doing things. Normally the transaction mutex would have to be acquired last after first you acquire this uh, lock system latch then you acquire the hash table latch and then you acquire the transaction mutex but now we are violating the order we are first acquiring the transaction mutex and then we are trying to acquire one of these uh, hash table latches it is safe to do this if we don't uh, have a blocking weight for, for this mutex if we do it with a try lock operation then it is fine uh, because uh, if some other thread is holding this one and waiting for the transaction mutex, we will just skip this and uh, proceed to the next uh, record and, and next lock that protects it. And if we are lucky, then we will get rid of mo most of this garbage and we may run another round of, of this uh, optimistic operation. If uh, still after five rounds of this optimistic uh, discard batches, we have some objects left, then we will resort to acquiring an exclusive lock system latch and transaction mutex, and then we free everything that is left. But that should be rather uncommon or rare. So was this uh, worth the trouble? Well, it of course depends on the benchmark or on the workload you are running. Here I did a simple benchmark with about 40 gigabytes of data that would fit into the buffer pool and I let the sysbench read-write test run for 5 minutes on each thread count or concurrent connections count ranging from 10 to 160 connections in always dub doubling the number of connections in between. And in this graph we can see that uh, here up to 40 concurrent connections there is a slight improvement. It's barely visible on the slide but uh, you can see both for the average throughput we have slightly better throughput on, on the 10.6 development snapshot that I was using versus the corresponding 10.5 development snapshot of that day. And for the average latency, same thing, we have a slightly lower latency on 10.6 than on 10.5, up to 40 connections. But after 40 connections, I measured at 80, I don't know where the actual pivot point is. But after that, you can see that for this benchmark, 10.5 was actually delivering a little bit better throughput and uh, latency. But what is not shown in this uh, slide is that... Uh, the slow shutdown that I had at the end of the benchmark to purge all the history of committed transactions at the end so that I have a clean starting point for the next round. That one would take much longer on 10.5 than on 10.6. Maybe it is th thanks to eliminating the dictionary system mutex in 10.6. It's coming up in 
But also that was not so simple. If you remove some global or big contention point, like if you are adding new lanes or removing some traffic lights on a major highway that is leading to a city, you might get uh, more congestion inside the city. And uh, we actually got that when removing the Dixie's mutex. We got some contention in the buffer pool for the purge threads. We got, uh, got a reduced performance. So for now I added a small workaround. Uh, the purge tasks are acquiring and releasing the exclusive Dixie's mutex just to alleviate this. But uh, of course we need, need to do more, more work to improve the purge, make it more adaptive so that uh, we can remove that uh, workaround. And it's of course not a guarantee that the workaround is uh, making things better for everybody. But uh, that, that's the nature of uh, performance fixes. You never know what, what is the next surprise. Finally, I would like to mention some future plans that we know about, uh, that we are planning to improve performance. One of the biggest uh, scalability bottlenecks is this uh, log system mutex, which is protecting the right ahead log, the InnoDB read log file. Currently, we are holding that mutex when we are constructing a log block and while we are computing a checksum on the entire block. With a different file format we could uh, compute log checksums up front for the mini transactions, uh, transaction logs, logs and uh, only for copying the log snippets to the log buffer we would have to hold the mitex. That, that should help a little bit. Also another idea is that uh, we could use asynchronous I.O. for writing the log like we do for data page writes. Currently we use synchronous I.O. for log writes. And we know that the synchronous writes can actually block in the file system with a F-sync or F-data sync operation. If we used uh, asynchronous write for the read log, we would uh, probably get a bit more write performance. Also in the log system, we could uh, reduce the amount of explicit record locking needed. If there is a operation that will lock the whole table uh, or lock all the rows in a table, like uh, an update without a where clause, then it would be better to just acquire an explicit, uh, exclusive table lock for that operation. Or if we have a select star lock for update or select star lock in share mode. We, we would uh, better just acquire a table lock instead of acquiring locks on the individual records. So that, that would be nice. Another one would be that we could uh, use implicit uh, record locking also for updates and deletes. Currently updates and deletes will first perform a locking read, then create an ex explicit record lock, then release the page latch and then reacquire the page latch when we are coming again to InnoDB with another uh, member function call. And then we have this uh, explicit record block that is protecting us. But if we didn't uh, release and reacquire the page latch for that short period, we wouldn't have to create that uh, explicit record block at all. We would also save some other trouble like, like the prefetch buffer that we currently have in InnoDB. For improving NUMA scalability, I guess we could still look at uh, whether we could improve our homebrew mutex implementation to be more NUMA friendly. But uh, other than that, I think we need to think about even bigger changes, which may be unfeasible or may require lots of effort. But uh, generally, to have better performance on non-uniform memory access systems, is uh, to avoid frequent cache invalidation between NUMA nodes or CPU sockets. So you don't want to have a situation where the ownership of some data is uh, frequently passing between NUMA nodes. We would 
have to make uh, data structures and uh, the thread pool somehow aware of, of these uh, processor sets or numerals or CPU sockets. That's probably something outside of InnoDB. So that is all I wanted to say in this talk. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marco, for the presentation. Um, can you tell us a, a bit about how you started to think about NODB locking and latches and improving them? Yeah, I think it started a couple of years ago when I was working on the 10.5 release and uh, simplifying the buffer pool. I got rid of the buffer pool mutex and uh, then it turned out that uh, something needs to be done also about the uh, so, sorry, I, I got rid of the block mutex, but not, not the buffer pool mutex. For the buffer pool mutex, one thing that had to be done was uh, uh, to introduce a smarter page hash. That uh, when you are looking up a page ID, table space ID, and page number, we are using a spin loop, a spin lock in 10.5 code already for that. That is a special case because uh, the critical sections are typically very short. So we use a spin lock type of uh, mutex for, for that hash table. And uh, then I thought that uh, it would be nice to have this uh, very small mutex or, or latch to be used elsewhere. And also, I, for a long time, I, I wasn't satisfied with uh, the InnoDB homebrew mutexes, which were too big and, uh, and there were various issues like uh, this uh, UT delay function consuming a lot of CPU cycles on useless spinning and so on. Yeah, I remember looking at that heaps of times going, what can we do? The, the problem is bigger than just this loop. So um, Yes, I, th I think that it was mostly a workaround for poorly written code. Like a, there used to be a contention on transaction system mutex and uh, on file system mutex and uh, different mutexes and for m most of them, but also in ten, uh, six, uh, the lock system mutex. Yeah, that that yeah, was so very important to fix because them all exclusively. That meant you had to actually spin more. Right uh, for for that one, uh, spinning was a good workaround. And as soon as we went to the native mutex, then we started to lose performance. So we definitely had to split that mutex. True. True. Okay. Um, you mentioned like the order increment was like in the, the same cache line now as its value, and that obviously provides the cache locality. Does that mean there's an opportunity to go further in to change some of these operations to atomic memory operations? Well, actually, for the auto increment uh, mutex, there is an old MDEV that we should uh, uh, remove this uh, auto increment locking all together and instead fix the problem in the replication layer. Problem is that for statement-based replication, we need this uh, special auto-increment lock mode, whatever. Uh, that uh, that uh, auto-increment lock needs to be reserved until the end of the statement. And that, that's exactly because of statement-based replication. For that one, I think the correct fix is to remove the code altogether. I, I don't think yeah. we, we can use atomic memory operations for that because we re really need to protect it no, uh, until no. the end of the statement. So just remove statement based replication then. <laughs> yeah, it's no, even better sure. better for the cache when you don't have any uh, when you don't have the data. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned the dict sys uh, latch. Um, what operations are covered under that one? Well, in the upcoming 10.6.5 uh, release, it was uh, simplified further. We don't have the Dictis mutex anymore. So the latch is uh, okay. the only one that is protecting the dictionary cache. And uh, the Dictis latch used to protect uh, the data dictionary tables so that any operation that is going to lock any InnoDB internal data dictionary table, it, it would uh, acquire this Dictis latch. But that, that okay. logic was removed. So now, now, now we are relying on InnoDB 
table logs for those system tables. And the Lixis latch is more or less, it's just protecting the cache. So readers uh, like table lookups, if the data is in the cache, they will use a shared latch and uh, writers or, or lookup, if it needs to be loaded to the cache, they, they will use an exclusive latch. So you're saying the data dictionary is effectively transformed into normal kind of tables. Is that an oversimplification? Well, it's a bit uh, simplified because uh, we still have a special recovery for, for the dictionary tables. But uh, other than that, yes, uh, we don't have that much uh, special logic around around the uh, dictionary tables as, as we used to. Okay. Um, how do you go about measuring uh, the cache locality improvements um, that you've done? Well, basic uh, sys bench benchmarks. Okay, at macroscopic level. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I made a uh, wrote a test program, and actually, I created a separate repository for for this uh, mutexes and uh, and read write logs. I, I would like to see them appear in some future C plus plus standard. So I did some benchmarking with that as well. But uh, of course, it's an artificial benchmark. You start a large number of threads, and uh, and then uh, all of them will bombard the same mutex and. Uh, it turns out that, uh, of course, the more CPUs you have, the slower it will run. Like on a laptop with uh, four or eight uh, cores or, or threads, uh, it will run faster than on a Numa machine with two sockets and uh, 40 threads. Yeah. Uh, I've seen, I guess, the um, Linux kernel and uh, glibc folks um, waiting a number of years to try to um, refine and, and reinvent <laughs> locking. So um, well done on getting something out the door and, and that works for NADB. Yeah, I think uh, there is no ma magic bullet in locking. You can do some things at the low level, but uh, some things really need to be addressed at a high level. So if you have a contention on a mutex, then it's your problem. You cannot, cannot blame the implementation. But there are also some implementation problems. One surprise that I just learned, maybe it was this week, that uh, this atomic fetch or fetch and and such operations, if they are operating on a sin single bit, then there would be a, an Intel 386 instruction lock BTS, lock BTR, and so on, that could uh, do this single bit modification efficiently. But the compiler is emitting a loop around a compare exchange, which is uh, something that is recommended against. So compilers have bugs as well, and we have to work around them by, by adding some inline assembler, even though I don't like it, but uh, I think I will do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Plenty of comments saying delete this later when they catch up. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, is there any kind of uh, lock -ex escalation upwards? I mean, from row to page to chunk um, now? No, no, there is nothing like that. And uh, there is an op open... There is an open issue that uh, even, even for uh, tables can locking read or index can lo locking read that is uh, going to access all the records. For that one, we are we are acquiring individual record locks, and that's really not that's optimal. We should lock the whole table. Yes, okay, that. But there, there is definitely nothing dynamic. Like if we would notice that now we are going to lock lots of records, then then we should escalate to page level or something. Like that. We don't have that. The yes, only so thing that I is guess... kind of page level is that uh, that we have this bitmap uh, of all locks that belong to the same page. So it's kind of page level, but there's a bit okay. for each record. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so um, I guess um, if uh, DBA start actually, um, once you get the table locking for, you know, bulk scans, um, that means even at the query planning layer, there should be an idea up front as to how much of a table you're actually going to be locking ahead of time. 
Yes, I think if, if we wanted to have more performance, then there should be some kind of smart uh, read ahead or some, some kind of hints to the story changing that this query is going to access these uh, ranges and uh, the read ahead could start earlier or something like that. Also, one thing that is definitely missing is, uh, is that uh, we don't have any, any interface that would report how many pages of some range is in the buffer pool in some index. So the query planner doesn't make any decision that, okay, we already have this index in the buffer pool, we can we, we'd better use this one rather than load something else. Ah, right, yep, yep, yes. But those are really, uh, those things I think they are mostly outside the storage engine, it's uh, more the query optimizer and planner. Okay. You mentioned that um, changing to sequential um, log writes to something a bit more dynamic. Um, what kind of effects is that going to have on the locking system? Uh, the uh, lock, uh, re lock uh, uh, framing change, you may, I mean the variable size uh, blocks for redo lock. Or did, he get, did I get the right word, word uh, log or lock? Yeah, so, so you redo undo logs. And if they change from sequential to something else, does, is that going to change some bottlenecks in some way? Well, I think that uh, this uh, circular redo lock is probably easiest to deal with. Uh, I was at some point I was thinking that uh, we should have an append only log file and, and then invoke some special file system operation to, to trim the start of the file. But uh, now, now I think uh, that, that the circular write, write is easier. It uh, works everywhere and uh, can be pretty efficient and easy to map to persistent memory as well. But uh, what we can can do is uh, that uh, we can change the redo log block format to allow it uh, to support arbitrary block size, whatever the storage layer, whatever is optimal for the storage layer. Like on, on persistent memory, it would be 256 bytes, and uh, on uh, on uh, anything else uh, on Linux, I, I guess it might be four kilobytes for, for yeah, the no. file system Sorry. layer. And, for, and uh, for that uh, that kind of change, I hope that they, it will also reduce contention on the, on the log system mutex because uh, we would be able to uh, compute checksums while not holding the mutex. Currently, the checksum is on the whole block. We should do it on the individual records, I think. Makes sense. Yep. So have you had any um, inspirational thoughts um, since you first recorded this talk? Since I first thought I have a bit, bit since you recorded the the talk that you've thought of in the meantime. Well, not not really on, on this one. Uh, only there have been some some small improvements on, on these uh, atomic uh, mutex primitives to to make them perform better on Intel architecture to make use of these lock BTS instruction and so on. But uh, nothing nothing really has changed. Uh, in this uh, about one month. Okay, Mark, I think that's all we've got time for um, in Q&A. So um, thank you for all the work um, in improving it. And thank you for presenting today. Yeah, thank you. It was great to be here. Thank you.